Hey, hey there, Tommy K. Happy Hallelujah Day to you. And we're going through popular objections to the reconciliation of all things number 15. And this will be Gehenna part 4. Inside of that, we are still reading from the book of George Saris, Heaven's Doors. Let's jump right on in. Explaining the Greek word Gehenna. Its use outside scripture. The authors of the Apocrypha, written between 500 to 150 B.C., Philo wrote around A.D. 40, and Josephus, who wrote from A.D. 70 to 100, all refer to the future punishment of the wicked, but none of them ever used the word Gehenna to describe it. It wasn't until after the destruction of Jerusalem that the term began to take on a meaning associated with after-death punishment. And even that, it didn't refer to a place of endless punishment. Origen studied Hebrew for the express purpose of interpreting Scripture. He tells us that his studies revealed what the Jews really meant by Gehenna. Besides its primary meaning of the Valley of Hinnom outside Jerusalem, it had come to acquire the secondary meaning of punishment with the intent to purify. Seeking to ascertain what might be the inference from the heavenly Jerusalem belonging to the lot of Benjamin and the Valley of Enom, we find a certain confirmation of what is said regarding the place of punishment intended for the purification of such souls as are to be purified by torments. Agreeably to the saying, The Lord comes like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and gold. You got it? Purification, to purify. The first Jewish reference to Gehenna as a place of future punishment dates from the 2nd century A.D. It's part of a commentary on a passage in the book of Isaiah where the author explains that the wicked shall be judged in Gehenna until the righteous say concerning them, we have seen enough. After studying the writings of the ancient rabbis, contemporary Jewish scholars and Rabbi Simcha Paul Raphael explained their understanding of Gehenna. The generally accepted belief was that the punitive tortures of Gehenna are time-limited, not eternal. Gehenna was conceived of as a temporary abode widely believed to last a maximum of 12 months. The rabbis always maintained that in addition to its punitive aspects, Gehenna served as a realm of purgation and purification. Its use in Scripture the best way to get a clear understanding of what Jesus and James meant when they used the word Gehenna is by looking carefully at what they actually said. The consequences of sin. The first three uses of the word in the New Testament are by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. The popular religious authorities in Jesus' day were not that different from some of the popular religious leaders today. Much of what they said and taught was clearly right. But in their attempt to guard and clarify what they saw as the law of God, they also added ideas that were not consistent with the law. They told everyone that what they taught was what God's word said. In reality, what they taught was too often what they themselves said. In contrast, Jesus brought attention to the true meaning of the scriptures that the Jewish leaders had misunderstood and misinterpreted. The first time Jesus refers to Gehenna, he explains what murder is really all about. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother Raka is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of Gehenna. God is concerned with more than outward appearances. For him, offenses are judged by the motives behind them as well as by the actions themselves. Jesus is here referring to three degrees of legal penalties and how they relate to the motives of the heart. 
Number one, the first level is anger against a brother without cause. The judgment Jesus refers to is one of the lower courts of the Jews. The second level of offense is contempt, expressed by the derogatory term raka or shallow brain. This is punishable at the level of the Sanhedrin, the highest religious and civil tribunal. They judged the greatest offenders of the law. The third level is hatred, as expressed by the term moros in Greek. The word means morally worthless, a scoundrel, a more serious reproach than raka. The latter scorns a man's mind and calls him stupid. Moros scorns his heart and character. This level deserves not only death, but also the great shame associated with having one's dead body thrown as garbage on the Gehenna fires. Jesus was not talking about endless torment. His purpose here, as at many other times during his ministry, was to show that God is not only interested in outward actions. He's also interested in the inward motives behind those actions. Just a few verses later, still in the context of how God looks on the heart and not just on actions, Jesus equates lust in the heart with adultery. I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into Gehenna. We hear about adultery, pornography, and various forms of sexual immorality so often today as it relates to the lives of celebrities, politicians, sports figures, and others that it's easy to think of it as not a big deal. But if you've ever been hurt by some form of sexual infidelity, or if you know others who have, you can understand the depth of pain that can come from what Jesus is talking about. Jesus was telling his listeners to deal with lust decisively. It's dangerous and destructive. In fact, it would be better to live without the advantage of a right eye, hand, or foot than to experience the moral, psychological, and often physical consequences associated with sexual sin. He likens those consequences to the disgusting, shameful death associated with having one's dishonored and putrid corpse thrown into the Gehenna dump. The focus of Jesus' statements in these verses isn't on the duration of punishment in the afterlife. It's on the importance of pursuing a godly lifestyle in this life. He's telling his listeners to make whatever sacrifices are necessary here and now to keep away from sin. And next time we're going to get into the fire of Gehenna, once again, hope you've been enjoying this and hope it is broadening your understanding of the Greek word Gehenna, the literal meaning of it, and also the metaphoric meaning of it as Jesus brought out.